Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the physiology uh, seminar uh, for the week. And uh, it's really a, a great pleasure to introduce uh, Mark Nelson. Uh, Mark is, uh, has a very long career <laughs> working in uh, all aspects of uh, membrane biophysics and regulation. And uh, he's most uh, well recognized, including being an academy member for his work in uh, smooth muscle and in particular arterial smooth muscle, where he really uh, made uh, many, many fundamental contributions about how uh, ion channels uh, control smooth muscle, uh, both uh, their physiological uh, arterial function and uh, pathological. But, uh, more than that, I think you should know, uh, Mark uh, started his career in one of the citadels of uh, physiology in this country, in Wash U in St. Louis, where many of the people who uh, really established modern physiology were working at the time. He did his PhD with Marty Blaustein who's a lifelong colleague of many of us who work in uh, ion transport and in particular the heart, sodium calcium exchange and so forth. And Mark then also worked with one of the true illuminaries afterward of uh, membrane biophysics. So this is the group of Peter Leuger in Constance uh, where uh, a lot of the fundamental uh, early work on ion channels was done with the most uh, uh, simple but direct methods to actually study these things uh, in bilayers. So Mark has been at uh, in Vermont, in Burlington for quite a few years and uh, continues there, I think, to make really seminal uh, contributions and today uh, he's going to tell us about one of his recent projects, which uh, suggests how blood flow uh, may uh, really regulate uh, more than we are even guessing about our brains. And uh, this is uh, a really new and exciting area, and uh, we look forward to hear about it. Uh, I think we'll hear about some mechanisms we're all quite aware of how ion channels and particularly potassium channels are regulated, but in a very new fundamental and exciting uh, context. So thanks Emil for doing this, Mark. We look, I won't uh, take any more of your time. We look forward to hear. <clears throat> well, thanks Don. Thanks for the invitation and I guess uh, Great to be in sitting in my office, I guess. But uh, I'm going to share my screen, um, and I guess you can see it. Um, so, I, can everyone see that? So, uh, yes, we can see it. Okay, great. So, um, this is a picture of. Vermont in the fall. In the center are blood vessels in a mouse brain. Little green flashes are calcium elevations that are occurring in the endothelial cells that line the blood vessels. So today I'd like to talk to you about some of our recent work on control of blood flow in the brain, and in particular activity induced increases in blood flow, and how it works and how it goes wrong, and how we might correct it. Um, so so this is just to um, uh, let me have uh, pointer options. Okay. So I looked on uh, Google Maps just to see how far away we are. We're up here, and if I drove to see you, Don, 
it would take me about 27 hours and a lot of amphetamine to make it down to Southwestern Medical Center. Now, you can answer this question later. I have no idea why it's called Southwestern when it's just south of the Oklahoma border and nowhere near Southwestern Texas. But, um, so a little bit of background. Um, this shows a simulation of neural activity in the brain. Uh, one of the major goals of uh, our work is to understand the control of blood flow in the brain and how it changes with disease and age and hope and potentially how we can either prevent that or correct it. A few factoids, uh, the brain is about 2% of our body mass and consumes a good fraction of the energy. Um, neurons in the brain have limited energy reserves and they depend on on-demand delivery of blood known as functional hyperemia. So hyperemia is increase in blood and do in response to function. So you can imagine everything you're, at every moment, some different part of the brain's working. Visual cortex, auditory cortex, motor cortex. And when this happens, blood has to be delivered rapidly and precisely to the location of the active neurons. And dysfunction of the small blood vessels in the brain mixed with Alzheimer's pathology, which I'll show you a little bit of, is a major driver of dementia. And um, looks like Texas here, it start, just started the snow. Um, and dementia is in, increasing um, tremendously in part because people are aging and not dying of other things. A little more bit of background, this shows just neural activity measured in a rat, in the somatosensory cortex in response to whisker stimulation, and then the immediate increase in blood flow to that part of the brain within seconds. This functional hyperemia has been appreciated for well over a century. This shows a quote from Roy and Sherrington. Here it says Roy and Sherrington, or it could be the other way around. And the brain possesses intrinsic mechanisms by which its vascular supply can be varied locally. It, it corresponds to local variations in functional activity. So the central question is, how is neural activity sensed? And how is it sending signals rapidly upstream to the surface arteries to, to deliver blood? Um, this activity-induced increases in blood flow is the basis of um, functional MRI, which is used in humans and in, in other models, humans are a model, of, as a surrogate for neural activity, with the underlying assumption is that when the bold signal changes, a change of flow happens in a part of the brain that corresponds to active neurons. So as Don mentioned, and people have heard this before, uh, I was at Washington University in neuroscience. We would have seminars every Saturday morning for three hours, um, which was, I can tell you, not the, you know, not on the top of my list of things to do when I was 22 years old. But in that time, in all of the seminars we had, blood vessels were never mentioned. Glia was barely mentioned. But this gives you, shows you a vascular cast of a human brain and all the blood vessels. And the surface of the brain has arteries that penetrate at right angles into the brain and then become this dense network of capillaries. Your brain has about a thousand miles of blood vessels. The smallest blood vessel, the capillary, touches every nerve cell in the brain. Uh, this can put in perspective, and you'll see this in a moment. The capillary's width is about 1 20th the width of a human hair. In fact, the lumen is so small that it's actually slightly smaller than a diameter of a red blood cell. And we propose that capillaries are actually the sensors of neural activity to send retrograde electrical signals upstream to dilate the penetrating arterioles. So a capillary endothelial cell uh, capillaries are made up of endothelial cells, and each endothelial cell is linked to one another by gap junctions, by connections. So they're all electrically coupled. So if you visualize the cortex here, visualize this as a network of wires in the brain monitoring the electric electrical activity of the central nervous system and then sending signals through the endothelial cells to upstream arterioles. And I'll show you some more of that. And this is interesting as we were doing this. Um, um, I was doing some reading of former physiologists, and one is August Crow, 
He's, he's a Danish physiologist. He won the Nobel Prize in 1920 for his work on the physiology of capillaries. Um, and here's, this is a picture of him. And he said in his Nobel lecture, uh, in what way can capillaries be excited? Chemical, electrical, and mechanical. I'm going to show you mostly electrical mechanisms, but you will see a little bit of chemical, and we're also working on the mechanical aspects of this as well. Um, more at the later. So here's the basic concept from our work, is that the capillaries sense neural activity. They're in close proximity to the nerves. And one of the primary things they sense are extracellular potassium ions that are released during every action potential. So you can see the more active a neuron is, the more potassium is being released. This potassium then activates a specialized potassium channel in the capillary endothelial cells called an inward rectifier 2.1. This is highly sensitive external potassium. It turns the channel on. This causes a hyperpolarization, which then turns the channel. Then it turns the channel. Hyperpolarization also turns the channel on. And so it propagates through gap junctions um, and then moves upstream through gap junctions into the smooth muscle cells to cause smooth muscle cell relaxation and the increase in blood flow to the active part of the brain. Um, this signal we estimate travels at a speed of about two millimeters per second. So it's relatively rapid compared to other signals, not compared to the central nervous system. And if you, for the uh, electrophysiologists in the audience, this, we could liken this to an inverted action potential. The endothelial cells are high depolarized and normally about minus 40 millivolts. When this is activated, it causes a regenerating electrical hyperpolarizing current and almost like an inverted action potential to move upstream rapidly. And we can test this in many different ways. And one of the ones we did um, early on was we took arterials from off the middle cerebral artery from within the brain, cannulated them, and then Fabrice who was in the lab at the time, left the capillary extremities attached. And then this shows, the green shows the capillary endothelial cells. The red is a, a for um, smooth muscle alpha actin. And you can see where the alpha actin ends. And then with picospritures, we can stimulate the ends of the capillaries and then measure things upstream. This is developed by Fabrice Dabitron when he was in the lab. Um, he's from France originally, and we wanted to call it La Fabrice. The uh, nature neuroscience didn't really go for that. Um, it's too bad. Uh, he's now a faculty member uh, at the University of Colorado in Denver. And this shows an example. Cannulated arterial is partially constricted to pressure, measuring diameter at these points. Then Fabrice, about a millimeter away, applies 10 millimolar potassium, simulating what a neuron would do. And what you can see is that the arterial dilates from about 15 microns to 25 microns. This is essentially a maximum dilation. Also keep in mind, Fabrice is cannulating blood vessels that are 20 microns in diameter. So it's a pretty, uh, so far, there's Masayo in the lab and a couple other people can do it. Pretty good job security. This dilation is blocked by blockers of the inward rectifier potassium channel and is eliminated by the endothelial specific uh, KR2.1 knockout. The second test we did that shows a, a diagram of the PrEP is we then stimulated the capillary branches and then measured membrane potential in the smooth, smooth, the smooth muscle cells about a millimeter away. And this shows in this sort of cartoon. And we have the flow directed away from the capillary branches so that um, um, the, the potassium is not touching the blood vessel. And the idea is that you turn on the inward rectifier potassium channel, electrical signal hyperpolarizes the signal goes upstream, and then it crosses through um, other gap junction into the smooth muscle cell, and we measure membrane potential. What we can see here is this is the membrane potential of the smooth muscle cell. Pico spritzing 10 millimolar potassium a millimeter away within 200 milliseconds starts to hyperpolarize the smooth muscle and, and it's pretty pronounced, about 25 millivolts. And this shows the diameter changes. In the wild type, you get, as I showed before, a large dilation to potassium. And then in the endothelial cell specific 
KR 2.1 knockout, there's no effect. Uh, Mark, yeah. can I uh, just uh, to try to keep a little interaction going and sometimes sure, sure. this doesn't happen in the Zooms. Um, what is the most uh, impressive uh, direct evidence that uh, the arterioles are coupled electrically to the capillaries? Um, the, uh, the smooth muscle is coupled directly. Yeah, so the, um, it, there's evidence, and we've done some of it, at a variety of levels. In the bigger arteries where you can actually or you can do it in these ones. Um, you, the, between the endothelial cells and the, and the smooth muscle cells in an artery or arterial is called the internal elastic lamina. And, the, and there are projections sent from smooth endothelial cells through the internal elastic lamina. So if you, if you were looking at it, depend, depending on, um, because of autofluorescence of, of the internal elastic lamina, it looks like Swiss cheese where the holes are. And then you can do EM and you can show staining for um, endothelial proteins in these projections. And then you can, um, gap junction proteins have also been identified there. There's also been experiments where current's been injected in the endothelial cell, and you can see the hyperpolarization of the smooth muscle. Uh, it's been modeled. So, um, um, so, so there's a, lots of direct evidence for it along those lines. Um, and here, uh, we, you know, People will also put gap junction blocking drugs, but most of them, you know, you, you know so you get whatever you want, basically. Um, so, but there's, you know, so there's EM evidence, there's immunostaining evidence, there's functional evidence, and the nature of the gap junction connections are also, uh, connection 42 plays a very important role. Um, so, uh, and although it's not, this is not proof here, to have a hyperpolarization travel that fast and appear in an adjacent cell within 200 milliseconds, you're really talking about electrical propagation. And we had a paper a few months ago, if anybody wants to read it on, on a modeling paper. And really the only way we could explain all the results are, and we did this in the mo uh, back up in the modeling paper was to have these signals be regenerated. Um, and then, so the other bit of way we do it, Don, is we also look at this in vivo with multi-photon microscopy. Um, so we can look down as deep as a thousand microns, usually we go 300 microns deep into the cortex. And we, I'll show you the technique. We put a dye, Fitzy dextran in the plasma and IV. So the green dye is circulating through the whole circulatory system. Um, and then we can zoom into a capillary shown here. And you can see here, the, the red blood cells exclude the dye. And so with this approach, and you're going single file, as I mentioned earlier, then we can do a line scan through the capillary and we can determine the velocity of the red blood cell and the flux, the number of red blood cells per second. And we can then take a second pipette and position with a different color dye and position it downstream of the penetrating arterial shown here. We can then puff on for a couple hundred milliseconds, slightly elevated potassium onto the capillary. Then we can measure, see the, you can see a puff of red. Then we can measure red blood cell flux and response. Um, and we measure upstream dilation and we do that. This is just, this is in the paper, but you can see if we puff in vivo, puff on potassium here, there's a red blood cell flux counter. In this case, the flux almost doubles. And this doesn't occur in the presence of barium, which blocks the inward rectifier from the outside or in the endothelial cell specific KR 2.1 knockout. And this shows an example of, you can see this, this is one second of recording. After 10 millimolar potassium, you can see the number of black stri um, stripes increase, essentially double. And uh, so that's another approach looking directly in vivo. So all this work comes together to say one of the major sensors for functional hyperemia are the inward rectifier potassium channels 2.1 in the capillary endothelial cells. And then we call this being whimsical, 
the shadow nervous system because in a sense, these, these sensors are shadowing, monitoring the activity of the central nervous system and sending retrograde electrical signals upstream to um, dilate upstream arteries. Now in parallel, this becomes a really fascinating story. I got involved in an international Leduc grant as a US director with Andrew Tell in Paris on pathogenesis of small vessel disease of the brain. And this grant ended in 2019, but the collaborations still continue uh, with Anne. And so a lot of these things, you never know, I guess my lesson from it, you can always learn a lot from different types of smart people and you never know where new ideas are gonna come from and you never know where things are con converging. For example, what I just showed you was really work that was being done understanding the basic physiology of how we sense neural activity and change blood flow. This was on a, a different topic, ostensibly. We also have a European Union program grant um, with Martin Dichons, and there's Anne Jutel, my collaborator, that's me, um, and uh, that's Nick from the lab here shown in Paris and the Sile from the lab at our last in-person meeting. We were supposed to be in Utrecht last year, but it didn't happen. Um, so a little bit about small vessel disease of the brain. Uh, it's one of the major contributors to ischemic stroke. Um, the intracerebral hemorrhage um, diseases are really devastating. It's a major driver of age-related cognitive decline and disability. Um, I now, as I get older, I take age as a risk factor out of everything. I don't believe that. Hypertension, genetics. Um, like Alzheimer's and other neurodegenerative diseases, they usually are silent for many years before coming, becoming clinically symptomatic. Like everything, we have a poor understanding of underlying mechanisms. Noteworthy is really no treatment at the moment. Um, and what we did in our network is we, we decided to study uh, the most common monogenic cause a small vessel disease called catacil. It's a mutation of the notch three gene. And, it's a, and there's about a hundred, wait, there's about one out of 50,000 people have catacil. So our hospital, even over Vermont Small, has about a dozen patients in it. And it, it stands for cerebral autosomal dominant arteriopathy with subcortical infarcts and leukal encephalopathy. And it says the most common hereditary cause of small vessel disease we view this as a window into the more common sporadic forms of small vessel disease, has all the clinical and MRI manifestations of small vessel disease. They're all, all, the, all the disease causing mutations are in the extracellular domain of the EGF receptor, um, and they have an odd number of cysteines in it. The, the place where it's expressed is in the brain is only the vascular smooth muscle and the pericytes. They cause accumulation of of deposits that are very characteristic. The mouse model has it, and of course people have it. And so Andrew Tell, for example, has measured the done proteomics on the deposits in the mouse model and in the human model, and they have the same proteins in them. Uh, and so this is a little bit more, many of the patients have migraine with aura. They start having cognitive deficits in their 30s, um, early dementia, um, white matter lesions, and they have decreased cerebral perfusion early on. And this is common for a lot of um, uh, d diseases of uh, neurodegenerative diseases. Um, so we have a mouse model, we collaborate with Anne, that overexpresses one of the uh, human mutations, and it has the deposits, it has decreased cerebral blood flow, and has other blood vessel changes, white matter lesions, um, so we've been using this model, and the data I'll show you now, it's at six months of age. So this shows, this is Messiah's this is work, this, some, of the, some of the key findings. This is whisker stimulation. Blood flow goes up, as I showed you earlier. And if we add 100 micromolar barium to the cortex, now this is measured with laser Doppler fluorometry, so it's measuring the backscattering of light. So you get a, a fractional change in blood flow when you do this. And what you see here in the control goes up by uh, about 30% blood flow. And in catacil shown here, it's reduced by about 50%. So these are, you know, um, yeah. So it has compromised functional, hyper, functional hyperemia. In other words, the activity of the neurons is 
The response in blood flow is reduced by 50%. Our clinical colleagues in France, part of our network, looked at um, catacyl patients. Because it's autosomal dominant, you can, you can identify them when they're relatively young. The human patients also have a decrease in activity-dependent blood flow. In this case, the visual stimuli and motor stimuli. This component that, that is gone is blocked by a 100 micromolar barium, which is a rather potent blocker of the inward rectifier to family members. Um, um, by, it works by blocking the pore in a voltage-dependent manner. So this is a scheme again, K goes up, hyperpolarization sent upstream, relaxation. Barium is a useful tool for blocking. The other tool we have, which is, uh, is the endothelial specific KR2.1 knockout. And so what effectively happens in Catacil is this inward rectifier component, as we've identified as the barium sensitive component, is essentially gone in Catacil, it's wiped out. So we went to seek the origins of this, and we used the Fabrice prep, and we pico spritzed potassium under the capillary extremities, that's pipette um, two right here, or directly on the arterial. An upward deflection is a dilation. Well, you can see this pipette two here, there's no effect of pico spritzing 10 millimolar potassium on the capillaries in this ex vivo pressurized arterial prep. It's completely gone in catacil. Again, consistent with, um, consistent with the inward rectifier being somehow non-functional in the capillary endothelial cells. So Osama in the lab went to look at that, and what he found was that the, this is, the downward deflection is a bigger inward rectifier current. Um, Don knows these well. And in catacil, it's re the current is reduced by about 50%. So there, the sensor of external potassium is absent or reduced, sorry, in catacil. The K dilations are gone in catacil and functional hyperemia, the inward rectifier component is gone. So here we go, Don. I clipped one of your uh, pictures from your website. And so one of the things that was learned quite a while ago, and Don had the seminal paper on it, that PIP2, a phospholipid, minority phospholipid, phosphatidyl inositol 4,5 bisphosphate is absolutely required for channel activity. Um, and then it's also been relative about 2,1, 2,2, this structure has been shown here. And it, this a minority phospholipid resides on the inner leaflet, and then it, it binds to the channel. When it's bound to the channel, the channel becomes active. So we thought, well, we, we lost about half the inward rectifier current. So what could it be due to? It could be a whole bunch of things. But so, well, let's just try PIP2. And you know, the beauty of patch clamping, uh, PIP2 is um, obviously a negatively charged phospholipid. We can introduce it into the cell through the patch pipette. And when Osama does that, he restored the currents. By, this is PIP2 in the pipette, and this is now equal to the wild type current. And I should also say PIP2 had no effect on the wild type current or the currents in arterial or, or um, smooth muscle. I should say this deficit in inward rectifier potassium channel currents, K, KR2.1, is only in the capillary endothelium. The arterial or endothelial cells that line the arterials, they have normal currents, and so does the smooth muscle. So we thought, you know, um, and also I should say in our, our computationally model, our modeling suggests that we only need to lose about 20% of the inward rectifier channels in order to uh, function, in order to be, turn the system off. So we were trying to figure out, okay, it's fine. You put it in the pipette and Don, I've had some discussions about this and PIP2 is an anion, so it shouldn't cross the cell membrane. So we can't test it in vivo or in our ex vivo intact preparations. And we're pondering about how to, to deal with this. But in the interim, I was, um, we had a talk from somebody here on uh, flip aces and scramble aces. These are ATP aces that transport negatively charged phospholipids to the inner leaflet. Um, and they're ATP aces. These are ones that have been described in 
have been uh, expressed in capillary endothelial cells. And here's a, this is a reference to a paper where they show that a loss of function of this flippase is, it seems to underline um, one type of small vessel disease that is driven by hypertension. Also, the endothelial cells have scramblases that basically collapse the, electro, uh, the, the gradient of phospholipids from inside and outside. And so I thought, okay, let's just put PIP2 on the outside. So Fabrice did this, but he didn't tell me the result. So this is a catacyl arterial capillary. He picospritz 10 millimolar potassium onto the capillary extremities, no effect, no change in diameter. He picospritzes directly on the arterial, which the smooth muscle and the arterial endothelium are unaffected. Then he put water soluble PIP2 in the bath and repeated it. This is amazing. This completely restored the dilation to 10 million more potassium. And this is basically 15 minutes in the bath. Our logic here is that, that we're providing an infinite reservoir of PIP2 to the outside, and these flip bases and or scramblases are transporting into the inner leaflet. And Fabrice, when he did the first three experiments, he didn't show me because he didn't want to get me too excited about it. And you can see the arteries expand here. Okay, so next step. Well, we, we decided uh, that we try this in vivo by IV uh, administration of PIP2 with the rationale that it'll circulate through all the blood vessels in the body. It would be then incorporated into the endothelial cell membrane, transported inward to the inner leaflet, and then turn on inward rectifiers, and then restore blood flow. And what you can see here is we, after 15, 20 minutes of PIP2 in the mouse, in vivo, laser Doppler fluorometry, we see an increase in the uh, functional hyperemia, whisker stimulation, blood flow goes up greater, and this is equal to the wild type, and the increase in blood flow is a barium sensitive component shown here. So in a matter of minutes, we've have been able to correct a defect that's existed presumably in the animal from, from the mouse for months. Well, uh, Amreen and um, Osama decided to take this further by looking at an Alzheimer's mouse model. And uh, in this case, um, the 5X fad mouse, um, which has a number of the human mutations. And this shows some features of the Alzheimer's brain accumulation am uh, amyloid beta plaques, tau protein, neuro neuronal cell loss, which by the way doesn't happen in, at, in, in catacils. That's not a prominent feature of it. Loss of cognitive function, reduced cerebral blood flow and functional hyperemia, which is a, which is a characteristic of, of, of catacil and many other uh, small vessel diseases of the brain. And so we asked the question, like catacil, does this, is there a deficit and this signaling mechanism in Alzheimer's disease. So the idea is that the inward rectifier 2.1 would be silenced, impaired signaling, and loss of functional hyperemia. So this, these mice are 12 months of age. Uh, this shows going through the mouse cortex, the accumulation of beta amyloid plaques in the mouse model as five of the human mutations and of familiar AD. Um, so I should just go back here. Cognitive impairment happens early on, plaques early on, neuronal cell loss at 12 months. So we're looking at 12 months. Here shows another rendition of the 5X fad mice and all the plaques and their proximity to the blood vessels in, um, in a 12 month old mouse brain. This is the wild type. Reminder, functional hyperemia measured with laser uh, Doppler fluorometry. We go to whiskers, neural activity, increase in blood flow, and then what happens in Alzheimer's. Remarkably, this shows the control that in the Alzheimer's mouse model, the functional hyperemia is reduced by about 50% as well, just like in catacil. Uh, and this is also a, a common feature uh, in humans as well. The, the, the component that was gone is again the barium sensitive inward rectifier component 
um, that we've identified in the capillary endothelial cells. Uh, so this is sounding kind of familiar. So then Amreen tested this in vivo by looking at the increase in red blood cell flux through a capillary to 10 millimolar potassium picospritched um, in vivo. And this shows paired experiments uh, before, before and after 10 millimolar potassium in vivo, red blood cell flux goes up. In the Alzheimer's mouse model, there is no effect on red blood cell flux, consistent with this mechanism being crippled. Uh, so a K-induced hyperemia is lost in the Alzheimer's mouse model. Osama also looked at the inward rectifier currents. They're reduced by about 50% as well using uh, conventional, I mean, uh, using the patch clamp technique and isolating capillaries from the mouse brain as we've done before. This is all following the sort of same. This is what we never set out to do this intentionally, but it's all like, again, different projects converging on sort of um, common mechanisms. So it looks like inward rectifier 2.1 channel activity is decreased, and this might be responsible for a decrease in functional hyperemia. So again, back to Don's early work, PIP2 is required for channel activity. But the interesting literature, there is a lot of literature in the Alzheimer's field of compromised inositol metabolism in Alzheimer's, and it's reduced. In other words, PIP2 levels are reduced in Alzheimer's, but there wasn't a linkage to a particular blood flow or uh, a particular molecular target. So the question is, can we improve, just like in Catacil, uh, functional hyperemia? So um, um, Osama recorded the inward rectifier currents, downward deflections, the increase in current. As you can see, applying PIP2, in this case externally, but he's also done in the pipette, has a large increase in inward rectifier currents, shown here in the Alzheimer's mouse model. And there's no, the, this current density goes up that we see in the wild type, and there's no effect in the wild type of PIP2, suggesting that all the channels in the wild type are already saturated with PIP2. So then um, Amreen did this in vivo, same approach, uh, water soluble PIP2, IV injection. This is a reduced increase in blood flow in Alzheimer's. Add 20 minutes after PIP2 is added in vivo, large and doubling of the uh, increase in blood flow to whisker stimulation. And this component that appears is the barium sensitive inward rectifier channel component. Uh, this work is now in press. Similarly, if we look at the increase in red blood cell flux, we give PIP2 in vivo in the Alzheimer's mouse model. Now all the capillaries respond to 10 millimolar potassium by increase in red blood cell flux. So we've resurrected it at the level of the single channel, pulse cell currents rather, at the ex vivo capillary arterial preparation, in vivo in terms of fractional increase in blood flow in the cortical volume measured with laser Doppler fluorometry, and in vivo by measurement of red blood cell flux response to potassium. So this is sort of the summary of things. Inward rectifier 2.1, critical for neural sensing, sends electrical signal, inverted action potential upstream, relaxes the smooth muscle. PIP2, we have other papers um, that we can dynamically change PIP2 levels by activating GQPCRs. Alzheimer's or small vessel disease, catacil, this mechanism is impaired, basically shut down. And it looks like it's shut down because of a loss of PIP2. PIP2 restores the currents, the dilations, the potassium, and sensory evoked increases in blood flow. So one last thing I'll show just for, just for a little, um, you know, uh, bling is we have separate projects on, or related projects on calcium signaling in vivo. And I just want to show you one result because it's really fun. Um, we have a genetically encoded calcium biosensor in the capillary endothelial cells and actually all the endothelial cells uh, in the body. And we then 
in vivo measured calcium. This shows uh, a 3D volume of a in vivo of a mouse cortex with the dye in the bloodstream. This analysis is done by Grant, experiments by Tom Longden and Amreen. So you just rotate this around. Then Grant will mass the arterioles as you see them disappear. Then we'll go down to 2D and in the third dimension, the Z is now time and you'll see these bursts of calcium happening in the capillaries. And if you look for specks in the big ones, the calcium output varies over a factor of 10,000. And we believe these are, generate, these are being driven by neural activity that releases GQPCRs that turns, on, turns up IP3 signaling locally. Anyway, that's a little something to come. All right, some little take home messages um, and, and things to think about, you know, uh, blue sky thoughts, emerging concepts. The holy grail is if, if, is if cerebral perfusion is compromised in Alzheimer's and small vessel disease, and this happens over years, what will the restoration of normal cerebral blood flow responses do to long-term cognitive function? Will it prevent the decline? Will it correct it? The other concept is that it looks like PIP2 in its interactions with the immorectivirus um, potassium channel 2.1 in the capillary endothelial cells is a, a linchpin, a major regulator of cerebral blood flow, both in physiology and pathology. And we now have approaches to rapidly restore normal cerebral blood flow in small vessel disease and Alzheimer's with PIP2. This also has implications for more acute thing, uh, situations such as ischemic stroke, where, you're, where you have part of the brain neurons that have been, are, are dead in the center of the infarct, but in the penumbra, you have neurons hanging on. This might be also a mechanism to direct blood flow in the microcirculation to the places where you need it the most. And, and also, in the end, when I think about all these things, you know, as usual, you, you always get up and you try to, or it's our typical thing in the lab is, you know, you have a hypothesis and you try to destroy it that day and see how long it goes on for. One of the other things that happens in functional hyperemia is getting rid of the garbage. Perhaps we have it all wrong. Maybe functional hyperemia is, is not here just to supply oxygen glucose, but here to remove toxic metabolic waste. And that this might be the thing that's happening in Alzheimer's or small vessel disease is not the lack of oxygen or glucose, which may not be that severe, but it's a removed toxic metabolic waste, another area we're looking into. So I want to acknowledge people. Uh, this is a Woods Hole meeting, the Society of General Physiologists. I'm sure many of folks have been there. The lobster dinner is a few years ago. It's Tom Longden who did all the early imaging, the calcium imaging as well. Um, he's now assistant professor tenure track at University of Maryland. Dan Collier worked on another project in the lab uh, on, on TBI and calcium signaling. And he's now a, uh, has a faculty job at the University of Tennessee. Albert worked on pericytes and he just moved to the University of Nevada to a tenure track sl slot. Osama was having a great time as research faculty now in, on our COBRA and uh, he's, they're all great. This is a picture of our lab window. This is Mount Mansfield in January, covered with snow. Um, and uh, this is Fabrice, who's now, I've mentioned, at Colorado. We, at the Leduc meetings, we had to go to Europe a lot. So this is actually in, in Munich, and, and Fabrice, like a good Frenchman, is drinking red wine. This is Osama. We had a lab meeting, part of our collaboration in Manchester with Adam Greenstein, who's shown here with Susan Amara. We're at Hadrian's Wall um, uh, that Hadrian put up in 100 AD to keep the crazy Scottish people out. Um, a typical really sunny day in February. This is the Leduc guys, Albert um, Masayo mentioned, who's now on our COBRA as well. Gros who's a postdoc and, and now back in Denmark and Fabrice drinking Guinness beer in Paris. Long-term collaborator, David Hill Eubanks. I like, I, like to, I like to show pictures. This is Andrew Tell, my great collaborator. She got the Brain Prize in 2019. So I went there and this is our collaborators in Uk Shabriat, who are co-recipients of the Brain Prize. So I went there. Uh, and uh, yeah, I even bought a suit. This is the Crown Prince of Denmark. I forgot what his name was. Nice guy, Louis or something like that, or Eddie. Um, this is a view uh, of the lab right here. New research building in the parking lot. Collaboration with Mike Kutlikoff. 
That's upper New York State. Up here, north of here is Quebec and Montreal. South is Massachusetts. The, we call it the Deep South. We, we seldom go there because the politics are too, too uh, conservative. Funding. And Terry and Dan in the lab, other people who are doing great jobs, Tom Hefner, Maria, Jerry Herrera. This is just a good picture at the, on Lake Champlain with Fernando Santana and John Letters for chilling in the summer. And thank you, Don, and thank you, Texas. Hey, thank you. It was really uh, provocative and uh, exciting. I'm looking for some questions, folks. Feel free. Anybody? Julia's got no. a hand up. Who's that? Paul? Julia has his hand up, so I'll uh, allow him to speak. Ilya? Hello. Yes. Hi, Mark. Hey, Ilya. How are you doing? How are you doing? Great yeah. talk, as always. So I wanted to ask you about the, the last part. Um, so it's known that in Alzheimer's disease, there are also problems with blood-brain barrier. That yeah. Many Alzheimer's patients, it's actually, uh, you know, it falls apart. Uh, do you think this mechanism that you study here has anything to do with that? Um, yeah, I, um, yeah, I don't know. It, it could, it could. We didn't, um, I don't know about this model. I mean, we have, we haven't looked at the blood brain barrier, but, uh, um, it'll be cool if you can restore it with the, this, uh, uh, PIP2 treatment though. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's quite possible. I just don't know, Ilya. Um, I do know we have evidence in um, Catacil that that one that it's a deficit in the catch of PIP2 in production of PIP2 and synthesis and not likely it's not due to breakdown. And there have been other studies in humans suggesting mitochondrial proteins are altered. So there could be, you know, you know, once you get enough, you've, you've been down the road plenty of times, once you get enough pieces of the puzzle, these things that seem like they didn't make sense start making some sense. <laughs> All right, thank you, Mark. Thank you, Ilya. Yeah, so um, I guess that, right, the number one uh, uh, question you seem to be uh, hit, hitting on is what's happening with the PIP2? So could it be just poor metabolism? I mean, it is, it definitely can go down in, in ischemic situations and so forth. Uh, and certainly some of those kinases have very low ATP affinity and it has been suggested that it's a metabolism uh, sensing system or is it, you know, I, I guess it could be scrambleases, could be cell signaling mechanisms. So where are you? What's your best guess? I don't, I know. I don't know if I have a, um, yeah, it could, it could be um, metabolism. As you pointed out, I think we wrote about, to each other about it. The lipid kinases have relatively um, a low affinity for ATP. So they might be really, you know, um, sensitive depending on the cell type to the ATP ADP ratio under situations that would never affect sodium potassium ATPase or, or circa or any of these other really key ATPases. Um, um, so, but, you know, it's like, you know, have a, you know, I also thought there could be a bystander effect where there's some ATPase that's really turned on pumping out ADP as well, you know, and changing the phosphorylation potential. What is true, and I think you and I talked about this, you know, KR2.1 is in cardiac muscle. It's in skeletal muscle. It's in smooth muscle. But when we turn on G, GQPCRs in cardiac muscle, which happens every time, you know, adrenergic stimulation happens, you don't see like the, the resting potential go haywire. So these things might be, but the capillaries are really sensitive to this. And if, you, if we add a GQPCR agonist, as Osama's done, you know, it will silent, it will turn off the signaling within 15 minutes or so. So there's something about the capillary endothelial cell, and it could be metabolism, which may interlink with Ilya's question about blood-brain barrier and sensitivities there. But I, um, I don't know, but you know, it's kind of, 
you know, I'll tell you, because I'm talking to you and nobody, I don't see, only, don't see anyone else, but so I'll pretend there's nobody there. But if you think, thought about it in 1997 or whenever you did the first observation, that we can then ultimately takes 20 years to link that molecular mechanism to a physiological functional thing in the brain to blood flow to disease. I mean, go right from, from the molecular mechanism all the way through. Um, so it's, it's kind of sort of like, to me it's exciting because it's, it's biophysics, it's physiology. I never thought I'd get involved in pathology, but it's that too. Uh, so uh, so it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, let's see, there must be some more questions out there. Everybody's too timid today. Anybody? You get another hand up. Hmm? Rich? Yeah, he Where can, is Rich? He can turn on his mic now if he wants. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yeah. Now, the, the last point you made about removing waste material from the brain, yeah. and that waste material being possibly part of the problem in Alzheimer's, are you, are you moving toward any practical application of that concept? Um, well, I mean, I started taking phospholipids myself. Um, lecithin has PI in the precursor, so that's uh, my selfish approach. But uh, so I Say uh, again, the medication you, you just mentioned? Well, it's not really. It's, it's kind of funny. Lecithin from okay. soy has phosphatidylserine, choline, and phosphatidylnositol. It's over the counter. It's, it's billed for improving cognitive function. My bottle's empty, and it hasn't helped me at all yet. But I'm still <laughs> optimistic. <laughs> it appears to be working. <laughs> but no, but seriously, um, we're thinking about different metabolites to measure in vivo to get ideas about accumulation. It could be potassium, and there are other few other toxic metabolites that that may be more informative. And and the reason why I've why I think this may be more important is that um, that most of the estimates of oxygen needs in, and glucose in the brain suggest that we oversupply it during functional hyperemia. Now, and in 50% reduction, the animals still live. So the concern may maybe we're missing the boat that is really both things. It's, I mean, like I make the analogy like a city where you have the food trucks come in but you never have the garbage trucks go out, you know? And, <laughs> okay. Um, so, so then if that's true, Rich, then PIP2, by improve, this is interesting of functional hyperemia because it's, it turns on rapidly to increase blood flow and provide oxygen and glucose, but it also, it's like a fire hose washing away the, the uh, metabolites from, from active neurons. So we, if we could improve that, the que yeah, the question is what happens to the, the pathology or, or the cognitive decline over the long term, and which is more important, you know, supplying more oxygen glucose or getting rid of no toxic stuff, including plaque, you know, beta amyloid and stuff like that. So, um, so PIP2 is, uh, um, you know, so then the question with PIP2, can we have better delivery, formulations, you know, things of this sort that wouldn't be, you know, um, wreak havoc with uh, the body. Because as Don knows, I mean, you know, I think this is, we're having a single effect because we provide it in vivo and this, in the PIP2 in, in the bloodstream, the first cells and the majority of cells is endothelial cells. Now, wouldn't you think intuitively that getting rid of waste has to be very important, especially in the brain? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. But it's like one of these things. You read an introduction to a paper on, on you know, functional hyperemia or neurovascular coupling. The, the first two lines, including ours, say delivery of oxy oxygen glucose. They don't say getting rid of crap. Okay. It's usually said later on in the paragraph. But I think I'm with you, I, Rich. I think, I think this is. Um, I think it's going to be a really major issue for physiology and pathophysiology. It, is this information getting out to the working neurologist in the Dallas area? <laughs> uh, 
Well, you you know, no, you know, and people in Texas don't listen to people in Vermont. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, I have one that I would encourage to listen to you. <laughs> okay. Yeah. No, it's just, it's all really new. I mean, um, 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 the manipulations of HIP two and its role in uh, controlling functional hyperemia was in a paper a year or two ago in, I mean, in the capillaries in the PNAS, but, and Osama was the first author. We put some of the concepts out in a inaugural article in PNAS. Um, I should also say that the, the, one of the other ion channels in the capillary endothelial cells is a trip V4. It's a calcium permeant, relatively non-selected cation channel. And it has just the opposite. It's actually in, inhibited by PIP2. So when PIP2 goes down, that channel's turned on. Uh, so there's a sort of yin yang going on there. So well, you know, I have a particular reason for asking. We have an appointment with my wife's neurologist coming up soon. And it's in Dallas, uh, up on off of LBJ. If I mention your name, can he get in touch with you for a discussion? Uh, sh uh, sure, but I mean, it's, it's way, I mean, um, it's a long ways from therapy. Uh, however, since there is no therapy, you know, and, you know, and it works. And I don't, I should also say we have a, a third model of hypertension induced neurovascular uncoupling, which is under review now somewhere in the, PIP, PIP2 also rescues that. Because what happens in, in this hypertension mouse model, uh, neurovascular coupling is also defective and functional hyperemia goes down with age. And, and now big clinical studies have shown that hypertension is a major, likely a major driver of dementia and cognitive decline. Mm, I believe that. Do, do you have uh, clinical trials ongoing right now? And if so, are there open spots? No. None? So, no, what we're doing is this, the next phase is getting with some chemists is getting different types of analogs going. And we have a, a starter grant. And I'm talking to uh, the LaDuc Foundation has a venture capital arm that is, uh, that's involved in helping people that were, were funded by the foundation. It's in, it's in Boston. So I've been talking to them too, but we're a ways away. But, you know, um, um, so who knows? But you know, I think it's very promising. Um, at least, you know, at least experimentally, we can sh show molecular mechanisms and how, how we can impinge on them. Okay, is, is there a way we can keep in touch to, to be informed when those kind of trials come up? Uh, sure, but the, I, might thought, I think we're- When I logged on, on here, I, don't I, know. I, mean, I gave you, a, when I logged on, I gave you an email address. So that was captured by uh, UT Southwest. Okay. You should be able to get it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. If not, I'd be so, happy to feed it to you. <laughs> you can send me an email too. Um, okay. Mark, which other arterial beds uh, are known now to be regulated like this? Uh, are you comfortable that uh, it works in the periphery? I, I don't know, um, but it's a really good question. Um, um, uh, the, uh, we've only looked in the brain. Um, and uh, we have a project with John Lederer where he's looking at uh, he, um, cardiac signaling from, from cardiac myocytes to adjacent capillaries. And so it's, it's, it seems to be not, not with PIP2 or disease at the moment, but it seems to be uh, the same theme is emerging in the heart, which is, I guess, not surprising because the capillaries, you know, are next to every cardiac myocyte, which is also electrically active. Um, so it might be true in skeletal muscle or everywhere, for, I don't know. Um, um, but having said that, Don, one of the interesting things with catacil is that the, that the mutation is in all smooth muscle, all vascular smooth muscle, but the disease only manifests in the brain. 
Is that because the capillaries are the, the linchpin for it all and they're st they, they respond differently than say capillaries elsewhere? I don't, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Let's see, uh, Brittany Mason has a question. I've turned on, I, as far as I know, the talk. Brittany? Yes, I'm here. Okay. I don't know if any of your models would record this, but do you get any changes in interstitial bulk flow? Oh, uh, um, I don't know. So, um, I would think so. But um, uh, one of my colleagues, I don't know if you know, Mike Anitagard, has been looking at what's called glymphatic flow, which is flow of CSF down along the penetrating arterioles in the perivascular space between the blood vessel um, and the astrocytic end feet. And what she's shown is that this flow that's on the outside of the blood vessels in the brain is more the flow increases at night and she believes it's a, it's a slower process to eliminate waste the prediction would my prediction would be as the arterioles dilate to functional hyper to functional hyperemia that that decreases perivascular space which will decrease the flow through the cortex transiently what the implications of that are, are i don't know um, so that's another aspect of even the resting tone of the blood vessels would affect the perivascular space and the flow of, um, and she, her evidence suggests this is a really important mechanism to get rid of over longer time periods to get rid of metabolic waste. Now we're talking about, you know, hours, not seconds. So that's about all I know. It's not much, I guess. Thanks very much. Sure. Okay, uh, any more questions, folks? Don't be shy. If you have time, I have one more. The, the young lady just asked about removing waste. You're familiar with intermittent fasting, where you have a period of uh, 16 to 18 hours where you do not eat. The theory being that during that time period, the uh, mitochondria in your DNA cleans out all the waste in your cells. Is, could there be some relationship there? I don't know, I, I guess so, but I, I... Are you familiar with intermittent fasting? Yeah, 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 yeah. I've never done it, but I'm familiar with it, yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, I don't know, Rich, I really don't know. There could be, yeah. it's not obvious to me what it is. Yeah, I, I attempt to do that. I've never been certain that I'm getting results, so it's, it's too slow. You can't know on an individual. Yeah. On an individual basis. Okay. Hey, thank you very much for thank your you. time and effort. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So uh, if there's not uh, more questions right now, uh, we'll thank Mark again for a really uh, provocative and interesting talk. And I hope, can you stay on a minute, Mark? We can sure. chat a little bit. Sure. Great. Okay. Not going anywhere. <laughs>